Today's date, September 25th, and it is a Wednesday night. Our sermon title is Full Gospel. Come on, you guys remember our waypoints were on Full Gospel. Wasn't this an amazing worship service? Like, in a way that's kind of memorable. It is so much more fun to be all in for the kingdom. I know that there are men and women in this room that got all that could be had tonight. And they're going to keep rolling in it, consuming as much as they can. Marlon, Lena got all they could get in that moment. I see the Rosales brothers back there getting filled with the joy of the Lord. Ibrahim and Eve, Zachary. Tonight, we want every man, every woman, every child to get to experience that. We're not going to rest on the zeal of others or the fire of others. Do you want it all? Yes. Every one of you? We had such a powerful worship service. People are crying out in joy. I had the blessing of worshiping near Ray Pena tonight. And I'm thinking about ordering him a drum set cage just to protect the rest of us. He was so excited. You guys going to continue in a fiery zeal for all of the gospel? Then let's go to Genesis 40 together. We're going to pick up in the fourth verse. Somebody say full gospel when you get there. Full gospel. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time. Fifth verse, please. Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, were being held in prison. They had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. So we have Joseph here who's in prison. And two men have a dream. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. Can somebody say dejected? Dejected. This should call to mind Cain's face and how God responded to him when he saw a countenance. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. The reason we're starting here is Joseph is an example of a type of Christ in the law. And he's also an example of how we should live. Joseph is in prison in this passage. He's been demoted. He's been put in a situation that is holistically unfair in every way. But there was a certain thing that was assigned to him. You guys remember the prophecy? during worship about you being a stone that was living in place and that we must joyfully uh, accept how God is trying to position us, where he has placed us and how he wants to shape us. Joseph knew where he was assigned, even if it was prison, even if it was difficult, even if there were things that he was having to fight for and endure that just weren't fair. And when he saw two men with a countenance that was like Cain, he felt a responsibility. He felt a responsibility to those that were placed in front of him. Can you imagine how easy in prison it would be just to worry about your own needs? You're trying not to make waves, trying not to cause trouble. Often in this room, we'll have a countenance that says that we're dejected. That without you speaking, we can see that you're somewhere near Cain versus Abel. That something inside of you has been twisted up. What we're advocating for here is that a man of God who knows his assignment takes responsibility for the men and women that are around him. If he put them in your life, then you have an obligation to them. In the Spirit's power, we have two messages that come forth from this. One message is to a cupbearer. This cupbearer hears the message of salvation. Here's a message of hope. Here's a message of how God is going to restore his life. The other message is about judgment, a fiery judgment that is going to come suddenly and cannot be turned away. But both of the messages that Joseph preached were full gospel. See, the way in which we relate to the Lord is that we reflect what he feels in the moment, how he responds in the moment, what his thoughts are about us and mankind. Brother Ohad shared with us this evening 
about how we feel about ourselves makes no difference to God. He wants us to see how he feels about us. The same is true for the people that are around you. This man gave the full message of God's interpretation. Everything that was supposed to be spoken, and yet they were radically different. Have you ever wondered how Jesus can come to so many different people in the book of John or in Luke, a woman at a well, a beggar, and he is preaching the exact same message but in so many different ways? It's because he perfectly reflected the Father. What we want to do tonight is not just suppress our own feelings and choose just to be joyful or suppress our own thoughts about somebody. It's to cause them to die and throw them out of here. It's that those old emotions no longer haunt you. They're no longer calling to you. That you become the representation of Christ on earth. That joy that you felt tonight is how we are supposed to live every day. That we can be alive like this. Of course you're miserable if you're half dead and half alive. You're supposed to be all the way alive or all the way dead. We're not going to be lukewarm. We're going to be those who feel the revival of God in our hearts at all the time. Christian life is supposed to be joyful no matter the circumstance. And that's not because it's just some kind of strange Buddhist discipline where you're struggling through the pain that you're enduring. It's because when that feeling that you felt tonight is coursing through you, nothing else matters. Can I get an amen from somebody about that? Come on, church. Say full gospel. Full gospel. Full gospel. Full gospel. See, when you have the full gospel, it permeates every part of your life. If you have the full gospel, you don't have a full ministry and a half full marriage. You're not uh, a full preacher, complete, eloquent, excellent. And you're a half full father. Go to verse 20 of the same chapter. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his official. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hands. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. This is a full gospel message. It's not, hey, I'm going to ask you to tell me your problem, and I'm going to give you any answer that benefits you and makes you like me. He had to lay aside his personal preferences of what he probably wanted to say and do exactly what the Lord told him. Can we go back to verse 8? The last line in verse 8. Tell me your dreams. You may have the right answer to people's problems. I shouldn't say may. You do. Because you have the full gospel message. Having it and not implementing it makes it useless. You have to see people in a situation and say, tell me your dreams. Tell me what's going on. Tell me where you are at. What are you searching for? Because I have the answer. Now, when you do that, you cannot shortcut the full gospel. And just rely on your personal preferences. And if you have it, stepping into a situation, know that it may cost you something, has to die. And if you have that stepping in mentality that, uh, well, if the water feels fine, I'll do it, that has to die. We have to go after these things. In worship tonight, there's always a, a building up. It's why worship's structured the way that it is. It's we're trying to get everyone together on the same page, moving forward, and we're like a locomotive that's just picking up momentum, and when we hit max speed, stopping us is impossible. The same with having the full gospel. You have to have the, the initiative to step out and tell people how it is. Let everything about the situation that's going to affect you die, and do and share what the Lord gave you. Let's look at Psalm 45, verse 7. That's a good word. All right, everyone there? You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. If you love righteousness and hate wickedness, you will have joy. 
You will be anointed with the oil of joy. Now, you're, no one's refuting that. But I know that as you guys are working, you are, you are not portraying righteousness in the face of wickedness. You're finding middle ground. When you love righteousness and hate wickedness, you can't stand to be around wickedness. And you're, you're shielding yourself, you're insulating yourself in your job because you might get fired and it might make your day bad. People may not like you. Well, the scripture says opposite. <laughs> if you love righteousness and hate wickedness and you go after those things, you will actually have true joy. Amen. Amen. Come on. Think about this for a moment. When we're speaking about finding the middle ground, that is compromise. That is what lukewarm life is. Say this with me. The full gospel has no middle. We're going to say that again like it's the full gospel. The full gospel has no middle. The full gospel has no middle. It's a common saying in our church that our boundary lines are secure, a pleasant place. as a reminder to ourselves that we should be delighting in where we're at. That carries with it a connotation of everything that is within your boundary lines. Not that we're going to restrict ourselves. That God has placed us in a certain direction like guardrails where we know it's time for an all-out run in this place. That everything that is within your boundary lines, you're going to have. Daniel, are you going to leave your inheritance on the table? You're going to go get it all because it's the full gospel. We die for each other in our vision because God has placed boundary lines all around us that is forming the inheritance. That we each have an area of territory that we need to take in your workplace, in your home, in this room. We need to go full gospel for it. We're not going to just settle with the little bit of our territory that we have. We are excited because the boundary lines that God has given us are good. They're pleasant. They're righteous. And I want it all. Do you want it all? Yes. Are you willing, church? Yes. Are you willing? Yes. Just like Joseph, we're going to be willing, even if the consequences could be bad. Go to Acts 21, 13. Take an example from Paul here. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Ready. He is willing. He is ready. Whatever consequence, come hell or high water, he is going. And he's yeah. going to honor the name of Jesus. And he can't wait to bear the stripes that he bore. Do you want to bear the stripes of Christ? Yes. yes. Do you want to have that fellowship in his suffering? then we have to go after the full gospel and speak it in its fullness, not shortcut truths because they're convenient. The gospel is not convenient. It's not a candy-covered gospel that uh, many of the modern churches these days are, are preaching. This is a full gospel. I'm not just willing, brother. I'm ready. I want it. Oh, I'm, I'm looking ready. for it tonight. Come on, let's turn together to 1 Kings chapter 22. Guys, I don't, I don't know how you guys got to this church, but as you're turning there, I want to share a very small snippet of how I got to this church, and it started with a desire. The only reason why the Lord brought me from the nasty pit where I was to a place of great revelation and great power is because I got to a point where I said, Lord... What I'm doing is not working. I know that I do not have everything that you have to offer. I know that I have just a small little smidgen of what is available to me. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it all. Amen. And guess what? Look, he brought me to a place where it's possible. Amen. He brought me to a place that will equip, that will teach. That will disciple, that will model, that will go through the whole Talmudim process and and bring out disciples that are better than the ones that are going before. This is no small truth, but the thing that the Lord had to renew in me tonight during that first set of worship is, hey, have you gotten to a place where you got to uh, a place in the eyes of your peers that is satisfactory, but you haven't gotten the whole truth? You haven't gotten the full gospel. You haven't attained everything that you read in the Word of God. You see, when I first came here, the Word of God washed over me like it was all brand new. 
And I know that you as well as me want to read the word of God with the illusion of the first time. Like it was the first time you were reading it. But somehow it gets dull over time and we have to ask the Holy Ghost, renew that first time in me. Let me read your word and see things that aren't showing up in my life and let them actually show up, Lord. I feel like that's what the Holy Ghost was getting at, the first worship set. And I don't think we got all the way. I think there's so much farther that we can go. And look, a little spoiler alert, that's where we're going with this message, okay? Where we're going is, we got a good place, but we're going farther than that. We're going with a greater equipment on our bodies and in our actions. We're going for the, not just the perception of what is truth, not just a complete perception, but a complete full gospel kind of life that shows up and changes other people's lives. That's what we want to do. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 1. Now that we know where we're going, let's go together. Look, we're not going to leave anyone behind tonight. Nope. Not one soul is going to be left, to, left behind tonight. If you want the full gospel, if you want the full truth, if you're tired of reading the word and seeing things that aren't showing up in your life, and you want to strive after them with God's church, this is the night to do it, church. Amen. We're going to do it together. 1 Kings 22, 1. For three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. Do you find yourself in King Jehoshaphat's position? I, I think that I find myself in King Jehoshaphat's position more times than not. You see, I get myself in a spot. Whether it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's in the workplace, whether uh, it, it really has it has no bearing on anything where it is. I know that it happens in everybody's lives here. You get in a conversation and you're trying to figure out how far you're going to go. How far am I going to take this gospel thing? You see, I'm with you in the conversation and I can talk on these levels with you. But on the other hand, I also know that I need to hear from the Lord. Because this is not a cookie cutter situation I'm in. You see, this conversation is important to God. And everybody is different and I must be spirit led. You see, I get caught in this all the time. I get caught in these conversations where I'm like, oh yeah, the, the last time I talked about this, the Lord really moved on this passage and it's, it's kind of clicking with me right now. So let's turn there. Let's go there. Hey, what if I just prayed for you? Can I just pray? Blessings, brother. Blessings. Blessings. Yes. It's embarrassing. You see, when we talk about it out loud like this, after the Holy Spirit is enlightening our, our souls about this concept, isn't it embarrassing? Isn't it a little bit, I, I'm talking a little bit sheepish here. Jehoshaphat is straddling two things here. He's standing a lame, tame, straddling a lame, tame gospel, and he's straddling a full gospel with God's power. Let's continue to read. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Man, don't you love prophets like this? 400 prophets that are all telling you, go, 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 go. Let's keep reading. There's going to be a couple different groups here. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? Man, thank you, Jehoshaphat. Get some, get some wits about you, brother. The king Catch of Israel up. answered Jehoshaphat, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I, somebody say hate him. Hate him. I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. Come on, Micaiah. Somebody say amen. amen. We were sitting together last night reading this with Micaiah, and the Lord's just breathing on it. It was an incredible experience. Man. Incredible, incredible man of God. Ahab, look, 
Don't you get the, get the uh, idea that Ahab's just kind of whining here? Yeah. Look, one of our axioms here at LCM is stop whining. <laughs> just simply stop it. Ahab, stop whining, dude. I can hear your whining from here. I can hear your whining through the millennia, Ahab. You got to stop that. Stop whining. Stop sinning. <laughs> yeah, that reminds the, me. The, I hate meeting with him. Well, then stop sinning. Was... He is Micaiah, son of Imla. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. All right, we're, get, we're getting it. We're getting it. Come on. Come on. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Can we hop ahead to verse 17? Yeah. There. Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. Can you say that that wasn't accepted by Micaiah's audience like it should have been? Look, we have a few different groups here. We have Ahab. He's living in unbelief. He does not believe what the Lord desires to do. Neither does he want to hear any of it. He's at the point where he's completely maxed out. He's completely maxed out on his faith. He doesn't want to go any farther. Then we've got these 400 prophets. They get pleasure from people agreeing with their passionate stance. Yeah. You see, this is not unlike everyone around us and not unlike us you see I get myself in conversations all the time where I don't know how I'm gonna get out of them so hey let's just make sure that we end in agreement of some sort that can be a default for me that can show up as a default yep. these 400 prophets their default is to stand in line and make sure that things go smoothly <laughs> without bumps Make sure that there are no rough edges. It's not about the full gospel. It's about a full paycheck at the end of the day. Then you got Jehoshaphat. He's kind of straddling these two lines. He's trying to figure out where he stands. We can see him leaning toward the side of the Lord as the story goes on. And then we have a man named Achaia, prophet of God, who is willing to stand for the truth of God, yeah. willing to pray for the full gospel of God, willing to get the direction that God has for that moment and stand for it fearlessly. Amen. How many of you guys want to be like Micaiah with a full gospel kind yeah. of mentality, yeah. not straddling the line anymore, not, strad not trying to please your fellow man? No more compromise. No more straddling the line. We stand all the way on God's side, all the way for the full gospel. And if there's something that you're not seeing in your life, we're going after it. Amen. We're not compromised any longer, church. Come on. Let me tell you about my experience coming to LCM. When I walked through these doors, man, I was, I was hoping to impress people. But this is a church with the full gospel. <laughs> Man, I got laid bare. Come on, Chris, Chris and I came to the church at the same time. We got laid bare. These pastors, these prophets didn't look at our lives and say, where are you going? And we were like, we, well, we had tons of plans. Chris and I had plans like you wouldn't believe for the rest of our lives. And they weren't just applauding us saying, well, be a part of our church. Go. You'll have the victory. Like, you were stupid. <laughs> Go to Proverbs 12. You were stupid. You hate discipline. You hate the full gospel. And I was like, but I do love righteousness. Yes. And you little devil, you love wickedness too. They're not here to pat your egos. They're here to make you into mighty men and women of God. That's what the full gospel produces. Do you guys want to settle for anything less than the full gospel? We're not going to do it now. We're not going to do it for the future generations. And there's going to be a lasting legacy of full gospel Christians that are going to be birthed from this room. Come on, I can't wait to see that. Come on now, you don't have to answer this. I, in fact, don't answer it. But you love and you hate full gospel men. You do. 
inside of your mind, you ha- in your heart, you have this battle that's going where you're choosing to love what is righteous and hate what is wicked, even inside of yourself. Micaiah was one of those men that could be counted on to give the full gospel. In court, Keith can tell you about how you're supposed to be telling the truth and nothing but the truth. The gospel is supposed to be all of the gospel and nothing but the gospel. So we all know there are certain men that you need to talk to, but sometimes you're looking for a way to talk to somebody else to see if you can pacify your conscience first. We need to be men that people speak to knowing they're going to get the truth and nothing but the truth. They're going to get the full gospel and nothing but the full gospel. Turn to Daniel 2 with me. I got stirred up the other day. I was hearing about Shadrach, Meshach, and one bad Negro over there standing in the fire with a fourth man. I was thinking about Daniel. We're going to pick up in Daniel 2, in the 24th verse. And I'm going to read it. And I'm going to read it from my Bible this time. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Look, before we even get into this text, we've got to think about this for a minute. A king has issued a verdict that all the wise men, the interpreters, everybody who's supposed to be a guy of wisdom is going to die. And then he sends his dude, Arioch, like his job is killing people. I'm here to make sure that none of you get away. And Daniel wants to go speak with the king? Can you imagine? He's not saying, uh, uh, hey, you think I can slip out the back? You know, like he's having a conversation with the guy whose job is to hunt people down and kill him. And he's in that number. And he says, take me to the king. Let me go see him. Let me go stand in front of him. I can do it. I got something to tell the king. Something inside of Daniel in this moment, rather than trying to step away from conflict, step away from whatever might be difficult, began to rise up in him, began to stand because he knew what the full gospel was. When I ask you in this moment, when you hear somebody saying something that you know, that you know, there should be a gospel light shined on it. I'm not talking about speaking abusively to people just so that you feel like you preached. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit is burdening you that you need to get involved in this are you looking for a quiet way to slide out of it are you looking to stand up to the plate tonight all of us we're going to decide that here and now we are going to stand up to the plate and choose the full gospel no matter what it results let's go speak to the king do not execute the wise men of babylon take me to the king and i will interpret his dream for him Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man. Say a man. A man. You're not a man unless you're full of gospel. <laughs> Among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. Come on now. This guy had to think enough of Daniel to go volunteer himself to not kill the people that he's supposed to kill and bring Daniel up to the king. He's taking risk as well. He had to see something in Daniel's life that was worth vouching for. You don't approach the king of Babylon without having completed his orders. They go stand up there because something that was a fiery faith, that was a full gospel, was breathing inside of Daniel. And he was longing for the opportunity to step up to the plate. And he cared about those lost men that were about to lose their lives. Wicked as they may be, he said, let me go see the king before all of this happens. Even if he himself could have been spared, he was concerned about the salvation of others. The full gospel is never just about you. And if it saves your own life, but leaves other men to die in their sin, it's not the full gospel. It's another gospel. It's a gospel of self-preservation. It's a gospel of sin. It's a gospel of something inside of you screaming out for what you want. The full gospel is sacrificial every time. That sacrificial gospel led Daniel into things that were risky that he didn't know in advance what to do with. You ever felt like you needed to prophesy and you had a couple words, but you had no idea what the rest of it was and you had to work up the courage to actually prophesy? You remember what it was to get filled with the Holy Ghost where you could feel something was happening, but you didn't know what to say? Something inside of us as men of God has to rise up again and again 
where we say, no, I'm not selling for less than the full gospel. I'm not selling for the light, the diet. I want it all in this moment. He stood up not knowing what the dream was. Volunteered himself not knowing even what the dream was. And then he tells the dream to the king and interprets it. See, you don't need to know everything about the situation. You don't have to have all of the details, all of your planning, all of your time in order to depend upon the Holy Ghost. What you need is the Holy Ghost moving through you. Can somebody say one more time, Lord? One more time! That you might cry out, Lord, I know you want to do something tonight. I know you want to do something tomorrow. I don't have what I need. I don't know what I need to know. But Lord, one more time, will you fill me with your power? Lord, I believe you have the full gospel. Will you give it to me? I need it inside of me, not out there. I need it in my soul. Just the same way that he filled some of you to the brim this evening. We have that full gospel available to us, but more than us, our hearers. Something in Daniel's life was demonstrably holy so that when he stood to speak, even lost men around him recognized that this was a man of God by his character. He lived a full gospel. Amen. Come on, a gospel that only saves you, only benefits you, isn't really a gospel at all. It's not. The full gospel will bless you and you will give everything to get it. And it'll be the very thing that you have to bless others. Let's go to John 18. Amen. Let's go to say a full gospel when you get to verse 19. When you think about your witness, I want you to consider this. Let's think about Psalm 45, 7. I love righteousness. I hate wickedness. When you speak, does it divide people? Does it even get people's attention? Because what I see in preaching, just in general, in the American church, the worldly church, is that the righteous and the wicked can sit in the same room, hear the exact same message, and mutually be benefited. Shouldn't the full gospel be like a sword piercing the souls of people, making a divide? Do you hate God or do you love Him? There is no middle ground. And when you're out witnessing and you're, you're sitting with your coworkers or you're sitting with people on the street, are you just telling them what only benefits you? Because if it's benefiting you, they'll think, oh, I can have that as well. Now both of us are feeling pretty good about ourselves. And if someone's listening... They'll hear the gospel that you're preaching. It's like, that gospel doesn't require anything of me. Of course I'm on board. Yeah, I love this. This is great. But if you're preaching the full message, Come on. the condemnation to sinners who love wickedness will be the encouragement to the saints, but there will be no middle ground and no continuity and no connection between the two parties. We have to preach the full message because we need to know who is with the Lord and Amen. who is not. If not, weeds will grow up and... In an effort to pull them up when there's an infestation, you might actually pull up good fruit that's trying to change, that loves righteousness, hates wickedness, but they're carnal and they need to be discipled. So let's go to verse, uh, verse 19. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Ooh, somebody say nothing. 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 Come on, somebody say nothing. 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 He did nothing in secret. He was ashamed of nothing that he did. He was ashamed of nothing that he spoke. He was ashamed of no teaching. He was ashamed of no action. He did nothing. That's full gospel. In secret. Oh, man. <laughs> nothing. And do we need to have an altar call right now? <laughs> nothing in secret. How much of your life is secretive to the people that love you the most? How much of your faith is a closet faith? And I'm not talking about a prayer closet. I'm talking about I am the most faithful person that lives in my closet. Well, it's because you're the only one there. You need to get out of the closet, get out into the world that needs the full gospel and start preaching. Verse 21. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know, they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him uh, in the face. (laughs) 
I can't go anywhere with these guys. They're, they're completely out of control. But you know what? They're full gospel. And, and that makes them... That makes them worthy of my life being laid down, that they can partake in everything God has for them. And because they're full gospel men, they're saying, we're not leaving Peyton behind. There's something pretty special about working in a a tri-unity, if you will. A a kind of God-ordained mission that he's formed from the beginning of time, and we're just now seeing the culmination of it. Uh, But let's pick up, because this is uh, verse 22. This is important. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Uh, Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? Is this how you answer him? Come on, how many times do you get uh, approached? Like, what are you saying? Are you you talking about me? Of course we're talking to you. (laughs) But in this case, check this out. He's talking to the high priest. He references other people. And who's listening? The guy who slapped him. When you preach the full gospel, anyone listening is going to be convicted. People aren't going to be able to tune you out. They're not going to be able to shut you up. All they're going to, have, have to, all they're going to be able to do is somehow demean you or physically make you stop. How much of your preaching is simply stopped by the thought that something bad may happen? Come on, do you melt when adverse ed- effects are seemingly imminent? Well, I'll tell you what, you've convinced yourself that they are. But the gospel never says anything about that. Jesus couldn't be stopped. People slapped him. People persecuted him. Tried to make him shut up. They even tried to kill him, and that still didn't stop him. No. And I tell you tonight, if you go after the full gospel, everything God has for you, they may put you to death. They will put you to death. But they still won't be able to shut you up. Because he's going to call you out of that grave, and you're going to begin proclaiming the greatness of our God. Want to know what a strong defense is? A foundation that is immovable? Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? So he had no defense, no legal argument, no special apologetic tricks. He stood on the word of God, his experience with it, and how it relates to them. You want to be immovable, then speak exactly what the Lord has told you. Nothing more, nothing less, and don't move from it. Stand on it. The full gospel is its own defense. Verse 24. Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Check this out. Dangerous Jesus. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you are one of his disciples too, are you? But he denied it. Ooh, the saying, shaky ground. I am not. Every student, when he's fully trained, will be like who? His teacher. Peter's seeing that. A disciple of Christ is seeing what it's going to take for him to be like his teacher. And in a moment he was asked, he settled for a half gospel. He didn't settle for the full gospel that says, I'm laying everything in my life. Aside, I take up the sufferings. I take up the persecutions. Not because I want to. I think the Holy Spirit in us will make us desire those things. Even if we know they hurt. But there has to be a time, maybe the first time, that you make a conscious effort against what you know you want or what the Holy Spirit wants. Like, that's what it's going to take. I don't want to do that. But I know that's what it's going to take because that's what my teacher did and you make a concerted self-initiated effort to put yourself in the persecution and not move for anything if it costs you everything i i promise you it's worth it the proverbs speak about wisdom yeah wisdom from god sell everything above all things get wisdom get knowledge get insight sell everything you have Pay every price, full price, to get the full gospel. Now, in this church, not just these brothers with me, we've gone through hell together. We've lost children. We've been persecuted. We've been sued. I mean, there, there's such a long list of just distasteful things that have happened. Yeah. We've, we've been in the trenches together. And why we're doing that, we're studying. We're trying to get the full gospel ingrained on the tablet of our heart. 
But how many of you tonight know that you've been like Peter? When confronted, are you one of those disciples? Oh, you may not be so bold to say, I'm not. But is silence not the same answer? We cannot remain silent. The full gospel speaks it out. You can direct it towards one man. But I promise you, other people are going to be hearing. And it's going to divide them. There is no middle ground in the full gospel. There's no middle. I can't say that enough. And as we go back into worship, just as I'm staring at every one of you right now, I'm going to be looking. Who is sitting in the middle ground? Who refuses to move? Now, I don't want to scare you. Yeah, I do. I want to scare you. Uh, Because the pastors are making me into the man that I'm supposed to be and preparing me for every work in Christ. I stand up here service after service. And I see the same people just running towards righteousness. <laughs> Tell no lies to the worship team. They see. <laughs> yeah, we see. I see you know, not that many people running towards wickedness. I see a hell of a lot of people just staying in the middle ground. Can we stop that tonight? Yes. Yeah. Can we hate that tonight? Yes. Come on, can we hate it tonight? Yes. yes. Then I expect as we continue to go through the word... As we go through the second set of worship, as we come up on Discipleship Helps Friday, and whatever we have going on Saturday and service on Sunday, that every day you wake up and say, I'm going to be full gospel, there is no middle ground. If there's a response to be had, I'm going to be on the right side of it. If there's a conversation to be had, I'm going to be on the right side of it. Because just to be silent or tolerate wickedness is not hating it. If you want... To be full gospel, you have to live full gospel, show up in every aspect of your life, and it will be the very thing that is going to bring salvation to the nations. Do you guys want to see salvation come to the nations? Yes. Come on, I can't tell you how much I want to see that, but I know that it'll never happen unless we get it right here. Come on, we are are literally in the melting pot, the the stew, if you will, that is going to feed the nations. We got to get cooked right. Come on, it may burn you tonight. Uh, I don't care if... I make eye contact with you. I'm looking at you to see if you're going to choose. You can get mad because I know if you don't respond, you're dead anyways. Come on, no apathy in here. Can we do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on. How many, of, how many if I asked you in this room if you wanted freedom tonight, you would raise your hand and shout yes? Yes. <laughs> now, how, how many of you Got him. want freedom from the world's perception in your life? A little less on that one. (laughs) How many of you want freedom from the chains that come when you are concerned with how the world looks at you? Yes. Yes. I do. I do with all of my heart. I want freedom from chains that I put on myself based on the world's perception of me. You see, the world's perception of you is the greatest enemy to the full gospel breaking out in your life. The greatest enemy. Man, the Holy Ghost is so awesome. The last prof- one of the last prophecies we had at the end of the first set was, it is not how you see you or anybody else sees you that is important. It is how the Lord Almighty sees you. Amen. That is the important, the most important thing in your life. Tonight, we can get real freedom. See, a lot of times we get caught up in praying about freedom in all kinds of different things. I mean, some are better than others. Let's just be honest. One of the things that I am convinced of tonight is that we need freedom from the world's perception on our lives. That, That if we could get freedom from the world's perception, then our full gospel kind of mentality and our full gospel kind of life would become unchained and it would explode. You see, it'd be something like, kind of like Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Can you guys go there with me? Say full gospel when you get there. Come on, then the high priest and all his associates. Man, there was a big old crowd. Big old crowd watching the men of God. And what they were doing. 
who were members of the party of the Sadducees. This wasn't just any old crowd. This was a prestigious kind of crowd. This was like all your bosses in one room kind of crowd. We're filled with jealousy. Let's keep reading. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Come on. Before we, before we move on to verse 20, I read stories like this all the time. Yeah. Because I really like the word. Um, and I like to read it every day. Uh, and so when I read stories like this, a lot of the times I'm reading them and I'm saying, Lord, I want this story in my life. I, I want these testimonies in my life. You see, the only way that these men got into prison in the first place is that they were DCD about the opinions of everybody else around them. You see, they didn't care a damn about what the Sadducees thought about what they were doing. They didn't care a damn about the full gospel that they were preaching, whether it hurt them or not, whether it was bad for their ministry or not, whether it was bad for the lies and the deception that they were propagating or not, they did not care a damn. Do you care a damn tonight no. about what the world thinks about you? You no. see, we will get freedom over this. And when we break those chains, when the Holy Ghost comes in and breaks those chains of perception from us, then I guarantee you we'll be seeing these greater situations come about in our lives. We'll be seeing what we've always wanted to see, to be in really terrible spots for God with each other and praying and singing throughout the night, praising His name, seeing people getting born again. We'll be in spots that we could have only dreamed of. There's chains to deal with first. Verse 20 says, Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. See, sometimes, before you get full gospel, you got to get full free from the world. Everybody say, full free. Before you get full gospel, you got to get full free from the bondage of the world. You see, their perception is not going to bring me down any longer. Their perception of who I am is not going to dictate my actions any longer. You see, I'm concerned with what the Lord thinks. I'm concerned with His opinion. I'm concerned with His gospel. I'm concerned with His word. I'm concerned with doing everything that He's commanded me to do. And nothing less will suffice in my life. Amen. Somebody say amen. Come on. Amen. Listen, Saints, we're a family. You can obviously tell we're having a good time with each other because we love the Word. We love the Lord. Can we cut the BS bleeding a sheep tonight? Just be honest with each other. Hebrews 2, we're about to read, says we must pay more careful attention. And it goes on to explain the differences between the two covenants and then how much more we are responsible for. What we're trying to say is this is a principle that is in our lives, that is in your pastor's lives, that is in many of your lives, that is not a neat theological subject that I'm going to explain 14 points to you about. What we're saying is the full gospel is for you, and God is saying to you, you need to pay more careful attention to this. I'm watching a revival in the McLeans that is coming alive inside of them. And what they're going to do is build upon this, not just for a few weeks, but months and years. And then we see dramatic supernatural events because of that. What we're saying is if your home, your property is something that is an idol in your life, keeping you away from discipleship, sell it, get rid of it, be full in all the gospel, everything that this church has to offer. And I get an amen, Assad. You guys pick up roots with your family, got little kids, school systems, all of those things. Whatever it takes, it's time for us to have the real gospel. Not for some of us to be pretending, I know you, I know your names, I can call you out, but I think you know who I'm talking about. Any area in your life that we are allowing our education to exceed our obedience is sin. We've been educated more than almost anybody that you will meet. I have yet to find a church that preaches the word or teaches during the week the way that this body does. And I've been around most of the world. Right now, something inside of us has got to decide that over the next 
10, 15 minutes as we are nearing a close and heading back into worship. Are we going to take the seriousness and the gravity of how God speaks about this covenant with us? See, a saying in our church that we've been hearing a lot lately is how much we sacrifice is how much we love Him. The more we sacrifice, the more that we love the Lord. So what sacrifice is it that you need to make tonight? What is it that has kept you living as a half-hearted Christian part of your week? What is it that has kept your marriage on the rocks and in disarray? Are one of you devoted to discipleship and your wife is resisting? Or is your wife faithful in prayer and you're just lazy? Where in this room do we need to make a sacrifice that is a pleasing aroma to him on that altar so that every man, every woman, every family is full gospel? Because that is what God is speaking to us and why he brought us here this evening. We're going to cut the bleeding of sheep, all of the excuses and reasons why we did what the Lord said. And we're actually going to do what the Lord says tonight. Like Samuel, we're going to go kill Agag. What is your Agag? How are we going to drop the knife and get rid of the things that have kept us corrupted when we want to be full gospel? Do you want to be full gospel? Yes! I believe that you do. And because I love you, because we're brothers, because we are going to stand together and we view each other as our responsibility, we're going to stand up after this and go do what the Lord is calling us to do. We're going to set this world ablaze. We have only begun to see what God is doing. We're seeing... Nations affected by what is happening in this little bitty room. I don't much care if we're in a garage, a living room, or here. I've done all of them. I've had some of the most amazing worship services that I've ever been a part of. Or in a bar in Russia with these guys. It does not matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what is going on. It matters that we take all that God has. And then there's an explosion that happens. There is a fire that results. We are heading somewhere with these waypoints that is going to affect the world. And it's not just a teaching. Do you hear me? Do you want to be a part of that flight? Yes. Oh, there's a holy zeal rising in this place. Yes. Let's go to Revelation 22, 18 through 19. Come on, church. We got two scriptures left. We, we, we have two passages left. Look. Can we engage with everything that we have into the end of this, into, into the second worship set? Look, I promise you with what the Lord is speaking and, and what he put on our hearts, I promise you chains will be broken in worship. I promise you people will get free. I promise you power will come out from the spirit of God in this set. Guys, do not neglect. Do not disengage. This is your time. This is our time. Two scriptures. Are you guys with us? Amen. Yeah. I warn everyone who hears the words of, of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. Next verse. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll have one point to make. Do not mess with the full gospel. Do not mess with it. Don't do it your own way. Don't have your own adjustment. Let me tell you something really good. If you got the full gospel in you, no one should mess with you. <laughs> Come on, do we have the full gospel in us? Yeah. Come on, you may not know everything there is to know because it is a 70 sided jewel but you are well on your way if you love righteousness to having the fullness of the gospel coming out of you in everything that you do come on we are we are fixing to launch into one more scripture and i want to see people get after it kind of like you're a little invincible like an apex predator in the spiritual realm because you got the full gospel in you the man who has the full gospel needs no defense, needs no justification, and the word of God is living inside of him, which means that our father who protects that word is protecting you. That whatever happens, he sees and he responds to. We need to live like men who have no care because we have no care. That only comes by believing this, that I cannot substitute any part of the word with my own personal preference, not for my children, not for my relatives, not for this person that I like, not this other person that I don't like. We represent our holy king, our holy master. And if we add nothing and take away nothing, 
but stand in the fullness, then you have nothing to fear and you need no defense. Let's stand up together because it's that time. As we stand up, we're going to read from Colossians 1, starting in verse 3. Before we get into that, though, I want to take a moment and thank you for being the most serious church that I've ever been a part of. Amen. I want to thank you for being some of the most serious families, some of the most serious disciples that I've ever seen, that I've ever heard of. Guys, tonight, there's more. Tonight, we get to step a little farther into the full gospel kind of message showing up in our lives. Colossians 1.3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You see, the gospel is growing in you. We got to figure out how the Lord wants to grow it in you and in your family tonight. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. You see, it's not a matter tonight if you're qualified or not. It's not a matter of if the very spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you or not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, do you have the foots, the chutzpah? Do you have the courage? Do you have the resolve? Do you have the desire somewhere in you, somewhere deep inside of you to go after it? That's what we're talking about tonight. We're a full gospel kind of church, and we're only getting fuller. So right now, I want to do something a little out of the ordinary. If you have a spouse next to you, I want you to grab their hand. And if you don't have a spouse, then I want you to focus on the Lord that much more. I want you guys to begin to pray. And as we pray corporately, I want you to begin to pray together. I want you to seek what comes into your mind, what, as the Spirit enables you, we're talking about seeking the Lord. We're talking about seeking what the Lord wants in every situation. I believe the Lord has a word for every couple, every family in this situation. You see, we're just like Joseph. We're just like Daniel. We're just like the men in Acts. We're just like these people. If we seek the Lord and ask Him, how you want me to grow, Lord? Lord, how do you want me to step forward in this word? How do you want my family to become more full gospel? See, I'm just crazy enough to believe what the word says tonight. I'm just crazy enough to say, God's going to show it to you. I'm just crazy enough to say, he'll speak to you. Guys, whatever that is, whatever passage, whatever example, whatever work of power that he shows you that's not being portrayed, go after it tonight. Go after it as we worship, as we pray together, as we visit the altar together, as we pray in power for the Holy Ghost. Go after it tonight.